Johnny Depp has filed additional assignments of error relating to Amber Heard's appeal. What's all that about? Let's break it down. So you may remember from my last video when we looked at Virginia Rules of Supreme Court 5A colon 25 that there is a provision in there that contemplates uh, one of the parties being able to answer the assignments of error of the other party by designating their own assignments. And they have to do so within 10 days of the original party filing their assignments of error. So what we have in this filing that Johnny Depp made on October the 21st is his response to Amber Heard's designations of assignments of error. Now, despite some early indications, uh, it appears that Amber Heard has not, in fact, filed any additional assignments of error of her own. And so a lot of people are wondering, how does this fit into the appeal as a whole? What, what does this mean? Uh, why is Johnny filing these additional grounds that Amber Heard, you know, we would kind of expect she'd be throwing up anything she could possibly come up with? Why hasn't she filed uh, any additional any additional assignments of error herself. So I wanna go ahead and talk a little bit about how this is working from kind of a functional standpoint so that we can talk about what are the strategic decisions that are at play in deciding whether or not to file these additional assignments of error. So the first thing to bear in mind is simply to remember that we are dealing with two separate judgments here, and hence why there are actually two separate cases in the Court of Appeals. So Amber is appealing from the judgment in Johnny Depp's favor, finding that she defamed him on all three counts of, of his complaint. Uh, Johnny is appealing from the judgment in Amber Heard's favor on the single count uh, where the jury found that statements made by Adam Waldman were defamatory and attributable to Johnny. The reason why this is an important starting point is because typically you don't get to an appeal from a decision if you're not actually aggrieved by it. And what that means is that if you won, the Court of Appeals doesn't want to entertain a whole process from you simply because you nitpick the exact reasons why you won. They don't really care. Um, at that point, it's uh, kind of a situation of just be happy with the outcome you got. And, um, you know, the, the reasoning itself is not really the critical thing from the court's standpoint. They can't really fix your problem because you've still won. So it's not like you're going to win more, win again, or anything like that. So you don't typically get to appeal a decision in your favor. So that's why, you know, Johnny's not appealing uh, the judgment against Amber Heard and Amber isn't appealing the judgment against Johnny Depp. But that doesn't mean that they don't believe that there were decisions made in the course of both of those cases that led to the particular outcome uh, that they got. And so in a situation where one of the parties is, is already appealing that judgment, Virginia sets up this process for the person who won to be able to, to respond. Essentially, the idea is, look, if this is going to get sent back down for, for retrial, if, if she's going to win on any of these things, then these are issues that came up the first time around that even though I won on them, uh, nevertheless, they, they were a problem. They were incorrect. They should be fixed so that if we have to do this all over again, this doesn't become a repetitive problem that we have to deal with a second time in a new appeal. That would not be efficient, so let's just all get it done in this single proceeding. So given that baseline, the way that these additional assignments of error fit in is that essentially Amber Heard is saying, I should have won, but for these errors by Judge Azkarati, and these responses are Johnny basically saying, no, you shouldn't have won, even if any of those errors were committed, and here's why. So let's take a look at what specific additional errors he's raising so we can see how this fits into the arguments that have been presented in this case as a whole. So the first assignment of error that Johnny is additionally raising is 
The trial court erred in denying Mr. Depp's motion to deny Ms. Hurd's plea in bar with respect to anti-slap immunity and in denying Mr. Depp's motion for summary judgment with respect to Ms. Hurd's anti-slap defense. That was kind of a mouthful uh, and a little bit technical, but essentially what this is dealing with is a pretrial ruling that Judge White made that uh, essentially held that Amber was going to be able to claim anti-slap immunity depending on whatever the uh, result was at trial. And the reason why that mattered is because to obtain anti-slap immunity in uh, the state of Virginia, the statement cannot have been made with malice. And so in these particular cases, the fact that the jury returned verdicts against Amber Heard and finding that all of her statements were made with malice uh, meant that, you know, she was she was not going to be entitled to claim anti-slap immunity, uh, even if the statements had, hadn't otherwise been found defamatory. So that's why he's raising it now, because if the statements hadn't been found to be defamatory, then Judge White's ruling left that door open, depending on the specific finding on malice. So if Amber Heard wins her appeal, it's going to go back down for a retrial in all likelihood, and those same questions are then going to be presented again. So if on a retrial, a jury decided, oh no, you know, she didn't defame him on this one, then it would still be an issue. Did she speak with malice? Did she not speak with malice? What Johnny Depp is asking the Court of Appeals to do is to say, uh, basically, before you even get to that question of malice, there are legal prerequisites that have to be met to satisfy uh, the requirements of the anti-slap statute. They have to be about matters of public concern. Uh, there was kind of a discrepancy from my perspective between how the court handled uh, anti-slap immunity with respect to Amber's statements versus with respect to Johnny's statements. It's not entirely clear to me what the basis for the different treatment was, uh, but the judge essentially said, yes, Amber is going to be able to claim anti-slap. Johnny is not. His statements uh, are private. Hers uh, deal with matters of public concern. So that's the question he is basically asking the court to answer. If we have to go uh, back down to trial again, was that ruling correct? Should Amber be entitled to claim anti-slap uh, if she can convince a jury that she did not speak with actual malice. Johnny's second assignment of error is that the trial court erred by excluding the expert testimony of Dr. Kimberly Collins, a forensic pathologist retained and designated by Mr. Depp. Now, uh, you may recall from the trial that Dr. Collins was identified as a witness by Johnny Depp and we subsequently learned from the unsealed files what exactly it was that she was going to testify to. Kimberly Collins had been provided copies of the photographs that Amber Heard was submitting as her evidence uh, that purported to document the injuries she claims that Johnny Depp inflicted on her. And she rendered a number of opinions about uh, that evidence. She also looked at Amber Heard's descriptions of the types of um, violence that she claimed she suffered and discussed what sorts of injuries uh, one would expect to be inflicted as a result of those types of actions and whether there was any evidence of injury that one would expect from, you know, this, this level of violence on Amber Heard to, you know, confirm or corroborate what she was saying took place. The example of her opinion that stood out uh, was, of course, her uh, opinion that the photographs that Amber Heard uh, presented detailing the May 27th uh, incident, allegedly with the phone throwing, that uh, those appeared to depict acne. So her testimony was excluded, and uh, it's not entirely clear at this point why that was, uh, but it does appear that uh, Judge Ascarati accepted uh, 
the argument of Amber Heard's team that Dr. Collins had only been designated as a rebuttal witness, that she had not been designated as somebody who was going to testify in her own right, uh, but was merely going to respond to testimony presented by Amber Heard's own expert. And therefore, when Amber didn't call that expert, uh, there was no basis for Dr. Collins to testify. So Johnny is arguing that that is incorrect. And I have to say, looking at the designation that was filed, the initial designation, uh, it looks to me like he's got a point. I mean, she's not designated as a rebuttal witness. She is later also designated as a rebuttal witness. Uh, but to me, there doesn't seem to be a problem here with any kind of lack of notice on Amber Heard's part that uh, she was going to be called in Johnny's case in chief, and this is what she would testify to. So again, this is an issue that if it's going to go back down to get retried, uh, this is kind of important. Number one, because the Court of Appeals should know what it was that she was going to say and what she was going to offer uh, as part of its evaluation of the impact of any error on the case as a whole. The Court of Appeals doesn't want to order things that are going to be a waste of time. <laughs> And so uh, if a retrial is simply going to mean that this type of thing is going to be brought out, that is simply going to, you know, reemphasize how the jury got it right the first time, then the Court of Appeals might be persuaded to consider any, any error that uh, did not you know, go Amber Heard's way that affected her uh, was still harmless because things like this is what the jury based their decision on. And it's also because if the case does get retried, then yeah, Johnny wants the opportunity to be able to make his case again. He doesn't want to be bound by, by this prior ruling that he didn't properly disclose her. Uh, so this is just basically an opportunity to kind of clear the board on that particular issue that was litigated and uh, get kind of a predetermination, so to speak, that uh, what, what he did was fine and that uh, Dr. Collins should be allowed to testify in the, in the case of a retrial. The third additional assignment of error is the trial court erred in overruling Mr. Depp's objection to jury instruction C, which required a finding that the statement was false instead of adopting Mr. Depp's proposed edit, which required a, a finding that the defamatory implication of the statement was false and denying Mr. Depp's request to conform the special verdict form to instruction C, which was given to the jury over Mr. Depp's objection. So this is a challenge that he's make, making to the way that the jury was instructed on the defamation claims dealing with statements made by Adam Waldman. And so this had come up during the jury instructions conference. It was televised during the trial. A lot of people didn't watch it. It is um, painfully boring if this isn't the type of thing that you're super interested in. Uh, I, of course, was super interested in it. And so I remember uh, this argument uh, happening. And so the judge did ultimately end up giving the instructions the way that Amber Heard wanted them. It didn't matter. The, ju the jury found that her statements were false. But the reason why this mattered is because it touched on what was uh, kind of one of the key arguments throughout the trial, which is whether Amber Heard's statements were technically true and just implied something bad about Johnny Depp or whether the statements themselves were, were actually false. And so the, the basic argument here is that, for example, the statement two years ago, I became a public figure representing to domestic abuse, uh, that that was technically correct, that, you know, yes, back in in May of 2016, uh, that, that, is, that is what happened. She rose to prominence uh, based on those allegations. And, you know, the counter argument to that would be, well, she did not actually become a public figure representing <laughs> domestic abuse because, uh, you know, she became a public figure uh, associated perhaps with, with domestic abuse, but she became 
public as a purported victim. And so that's that's the real problem. That's the real falsity uh, that inheres in that claim to represent uh, domestic abuse in the public forum. So because of that, uh, there, there was some difficulty in nailing down exactly what, what the jury was, was going to have to decide. And we saw this issue pushed by Ben Rottenborn in his closing argument. He got the, the, the instructions the way that he wanted. So then he hammered on this argument that, well, it's technically true. And, you know, learned the hopefully valuable lesson to him that the jury has to want <laughs> to uh, accept a technicality. They have to want to rule in your client's favor for them to decide a case on technical grounds. <laughs> so... Probably wasn't the best argument um, for him to make from a persuasion standpoint. Uh, but nevertheless, that is the origin of this kind of legal question about did the jury have to decide whether the statement was false or whether the implication from the statement was false. Now, as a little bit of an aside, uh, personally, I saw this instruction being given the way that it did turned out to kind of benefit Johnny with respect to Amber Heard's post-judgment motion that was dealing with the First Amendment. Now, you may recall that in that motion, one of the arguments that she made was that uh, under the First Amendment, a public figure can't claim defamation by implication. And in that context, what they mean by defamation by implication is a situation where the statement is facially true. It's, it's actually true, uh, but it just carries an implication with it that happens to be false and defamatory. Um, so essentially, because when you're dealing with a public figure under First Amendment law, there has to be a finding of actual malice, meaning knowledge that the statement is false. Uh, that precludes somebody from being able to assert defamation against a public figure if the statement actually isn't false. There's a variety of, of issues with this argument, uh, but taking it at face value, that is essentially uh, the argument that she was making. And so in that respect, at least, this instruction and the verdict form that went, went with it was extremely helpful to Johnny Depp because the jury found it was false. So it takes it entirely out of this situation where you're dealing with a statement that's actually true but just can be understood in a way that that isn't. Uh, th that argument is kind of now taken off of the table. It's really not, not relevant to her claim. So eh, I'm a little iffy on, you know, whether, whether, this is, uh, whether this is strategically advantageous for Johnny to be pursuing. Again, the point is, if Amber Heard gets a retrial, he wants the instructions to read this other way and not the way that they were given at trial. Um, so obviously he's he's got his reasons, his thinking uh, that goes behind that. It's just something that uh, I, I find interesting because of how that post-judgment litigation uh, did unfold and kind of the cards that Amber showed by raising that particular argument uh, does suggest that perhaps it might be better to just go ahead and leave the instructions the way they were. So despite some indications at the end of the week last week that uh, Amber Heard was also filing additional assignments of error, uh, as it turned out, she didn't file any. So what's with that? What does that mean? There could certainly be a lot of different explanations for it. It is possible they forgot. I would not consider that highly likely, uh, but it is a possibility that, that we can't rule out. Uh, what's more likely is that they simply chose not to. And so why would they, why would they choose not to? Uh, you know, the most obvious reason that comes to my mind is that when it came to Amber Heard's claims against Johnny Depp, there weren't a lot of rulings that went against her <laughs> that would really be good fodder for her to raise on appeal. Uh, when it came to 
the pretrial uh, litigation, the only things that really could have been argued uh, would have to do with, for example, Johnny Depp uh, filed a plea in bar, demurrer, uh, arguing that uh, the statements either couldn't be, you know, attributable to Johnny uh, or were not not actionable. They were uh, statements of opinion. They were protected by um, privilege, things along those lines. And so those rulings didn't go in, in Johnny's favor with the exception of the Num number of statements that she had tried to raise that were made uh, before the statute of limitations, uh, those were all thrown out. Uh, but there were, of course, as we saw, uh, three statements that were made within a year of her filing her counterclaim that were allowed to go forward. So that, quite frankly, is really the only decision that, that went against her. Um, there... I suppose could have been some evidentiary rulings that we we haven't seen all of the ins and outs of, of everything that, that got decided in the case, uh, but perhaps things that Johnny was allowed to bring in that she thought he shouldn't have or, you know, things she was not allowed to bring in. Uh, but we also saw a lot of what I would consider bending over backwards to give Amber uh, every opportunity <laughs> to make her case on these up to the point of things like allowing uh, Adam the, the portions of Adam Waldman's deposition where he does nothing but invoke attorney-client privilege to be played to the jury, uh, despite the fact that the, the jury's own instructions clearly stated you're not allowed to draw any adverse inference from this. Uh, so it's not relevant and it's pretty prejudicial to play that type of thing for the jury. That's the type of ruling that uh, really indicates to me that uh, Judge Karate really did um, go to pretty much every length she could to rule in Amber Heard's favor. Uh, by and large, um, I don't think this is that uncommon. Judges, it doesn't mean I'm not saying she's biased. I'm not saying she favored Amber Heard. But I am saying that judges get a pretty good feel for the litigants involved in any particular case, and they have a pretty good idea who's going to win and uh, depending on the outcome, who's more likely to appeal and what, what is that going to look like. So with these additional assignments of error, we now have the complete picture of all of the issues that both sides are going to be arguing to the Court of Appeals. Uh, as we've been saying for uh, a little bit now, the briefs are where the meat of these arguments are going to be contained. Uh, I am not going to uh, bat down straw men by trying to evaluate arguments before they're made, so I am going to wait for the briefs to be filed before I dig in deep to the legal analysis of these particular errors. Uh, but the good news is that that should be coming soon. Uh, the briefs are currently due to be filed the first week in November. So coming right up, I will be keeping an eye on it. It is possible still that they could be extended, uh, but I will be waiting to see and I will let you know as soon as I do. So in the meantime, please do join me for the next one and I will see you there.